started. So we were just beginning to get into Spark. So far, we've just done some Scala. Um, in a bit of a hurry, but it's okay. So I said basically the fundamental uh, object underneath Apache Spark is uh, the resilient distributed data set. And there are basically two things you can do with it. Um, it's um, transform and act. So transformations and actions and transformations are done lazily uh, and action is the final um, thing that will trigger a whole bunch of transformations and actually make the computations go ahead. Um, let's look at some specific examples. So again, our entry point is Spark and the Spark context and SQL context already made for you in Spark shell or on Databricks. And the first command we were playing with, with is uh, this one. Uh, so calling the Spark context and method parallelize, we can pass in a, a Scala collection, a non-parallel Scala collection with an array and ask it to uh, give two partitions and then we get a parallel collection back, okay? So this is a parallel collection resilient distributed data set of these three arrays. So now let's Let's take a first action to get a handle on this. So the first action is collect. Um, so collect basically brings all the objects in the parallel collection RDD into the driver's memory. So you, you wanna be careful about it. So in this little example, there's two partitions A and B with three elements. So um, you can kind of think about it like this, uh, scattered between partitions, right? So the Python code is very similar. So, um, so we we'll just focus on the Scala code for now. So we do, this is what we did. And if we do dot collect, uh, we will be getting the, um, the actual array back, okay? So GLOM is, uh, is a way to see what elements of the, of the collection are in which partition. Okay? That's all that does. And we can play with GLOM to get an idea of this. Get num partitions um, is, uh, is an action that just get, gives us the total number of partitions in the RDD. So we can sort of do this because we specified X to have exactly two partitions, we should get two. If you don't specify the number of partitions, then Spark tries to optimize and provide some heuristic to figure out what the partition should be. Okay, and I think in the Databricks Community Edition, it's six or eight or something like this. And so you can see how the things are distributed. So if you do x.glom.collect, it'll give you an array of arrays. The arrays inside are the ones that are in each uh, partition. Okay. Um, so you can do x.glom.collect and uh, assign that to a val A. And then you can see um, how this goes. Okay, so um, what later on you need to know is that when the partitions uh, contain quite a lot of elements and there are several partitions, then you know sometimes you have to be aware of where the partitions are stored in which executor and which, which uh, machine they're stored because sometimes you want to maybe take advantage of, uh, um, of, of uh, where they are locally. Right? But for now, we mostly just rely on Spark's uh, machinery to do all of the partitioning. So here's uh, another example. Um, we just uh, don't do the explicit setting the number of partitions to two and then see what happens. For me, it's two, but for others, it might be a different number, right? So in Trinity Edition, it was different last time. So, okay. Yeah. Yeah, inside each partition, I think, yeah, it'll just, uh, it'll just bring, bring things in order. Yeah. Um, 
I think so. I mean, I, yes. Um, yeah, because it will just traverse through it and, and return it. Uh, but the partitions themselves could be coming back in different orders. I'm not sure. But there is basically, uh, there is a indeterminacy as to how the, how the elements in the, in the RDD are going to be available. So most of the operations we do here uh, are robust to the order. Um, yeah, that's a good question. Um, so take is another action. It's better than collect because then you can explicitly say how many elements you're taking. So it's, uh, uh, it's good and you can, you can play around a bit more. So now let's look at transformations. So the first transformation is map. Uh, one thing to bear in mind about transformations is that some transformations are narrow and others are wide. Uh, narrow means basically you map, uh, so the, this, this little bicycle narrow lane symbol is, is there. Um, so narrow just means uh, when you transform one RDD into another, you, you usually go from one parent RDD to a child RDD, okay? Uh, wide transformations, you will see examples soon. There will be, you know, many, many elements and the parent RDD can get mapped to the same child RDD, right? So there is more um, somehow traffic flow. Um, so map is uh, a narrow transformation. So there's this set of Scala code for this. You use these, uh, anonymous functions that we saw in Scala, okay? So here is uh, ABC or BAC, and then you do map. Uh, you can put any placeholder here. You can put underscore here if you want. I'll just use Z, Z comma one. So this is basically gonna map um, each of these strings into uh, pairs, strings and ints, okay? So that's what happened here. Okay, so I can, I can collect it and then turn it into a string because the array that comes in from collect, I can use this make string comma, then it will just make it one line. So it's just easier to visualize. And so this is an array of B, A, C, and this is an array of these two bits. Okay, so map is like that. Filter is also narrow. So it basically applies, it's the same as Scala's filter, except now it's on parallel collection RDDs. So, okay, so we can try this X mod two equals one and just get the odd numbers back in this tiny example. Okay, so there's nothing really different from the Scala collections map and filter. Okay, so reduce is uh, another action uh, where we actually can do a, a, a reduce operation, which is a pairwise operation defined on the elements. So we could do this uh, plus. So in Python, you would use the lambda expression. Here you, you are using anonymous function, which is a lambda expression, but this is the Scala syntax for it, okay? So we create an array, one, two, three, four, and then we do reduce this pair AB to A plus B. Okay, so we get 10 back. Um, so here is a, yeah, so generally when you store an RDD to answer your question, you have to be, you, you know, the, the operations are supposed to be invariant to the order, right? So reduce, it won't matter because you can, you, you, later on you will see you can repartition RDD. So you can change the number of partitions and various things like this. So a lot of that somehow, um, yeah, there is no guarantee of order. You have to take care of any order you want to preserve on top of it. Right? Um, Okay, transform an RDD by flat map. So flat map is another nice transformation. It's also narrow. So it essentially, uh, it's a one-to-many mapping. So it can take say, for example, a sentence and flat map it into many words in that sentence, okay? So here is an example of a flat map. Say we have array one, two, three, and then it's X. And then another, um, uh, we're gonna create another Y by flat mapping X into 
uh, each each one of them is going to be an array of whatever we pass in and something say we pass in n n times hundred and then forty two right so now you can take one element and turn them into a bunch of things so it can be a one to many mapping like this and um, this is what um, um, this is what um, flat map does okay so if you notice why we simply have um, um, have uh, turned it back to, collected and turned it back to a string so it sort of looks like one became one 142 and so on. okay um, so let's create a pair RDD. So here, uh, this is a uh, key and value pair. Um, so if you take words to be se.paralyze and a bunch of um, strings in an array, and then we can do collect, and then we will just get the array back. But um, now if you wanna do a um, pair RDD, we can take words and map it to uh, each word s uh, to an integer one. And then we can try to collect this again, just to see. When you do sort of serious computations, you would never use collect, right? Just using collect. <laughs> um, show you this, if you should use take. Um, so yeah, so now you're basically ready to do uh, reduce on this. Uh, but uh, and if you if you reduce by key, then you can basically count the number of A's and B's and so on. But before this, uh, I want to show you um, uh, some wide transformations uh, so that you understand the difference between uh, uh, narrow and wide transformations. And specifically, we will study first group by key and uh, reduce by key. Okay. So so. So reduced by key and group by key are wide transformations because data has to be shuffled across the partitions. So that's the, that's the main, main problem. So, for, so when you have to shuffle it between partitions that are in different executors, then the data will have to generally move through the, the, the network cables, which are orders of magnitude slower, right? Than accessing the memory of the disk. And that's kind of the reason why uh, yeah, why transformations will be slower. So here is an example of group by key. So we have a pair RDD. So let's say these are your, um, your keys and, uh, and then these are your values. So we have A is the key, B is the key, and these are the values. Then a group by key basically will take all the values belonging to a key and simply group them together like this. So three, two, one, two, three, one are values of key A and five and four are values of key B, right? So obviously to be able to do this, you need to possibly move, move the values between different executors. Because if you have A, you know, the key A in some executors and also the key A in other executors, then you know, they have to somehow uh, communicate across the um, executors. So um, yeah, so basically when you, when you have these kinds of transformations, you, 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 you have to shuffle the data between machines and you have to be careful when you shuffle, otherwise it can be uh, quite expensive. So um, okay, so what is the other things to basically bear in mind? Um, so, um, okay, let's, I think there's, let's look at the picture of reduce by key. So reduce by key is a slightly different operation. So let's look at this picture. So here, what happens is, uh, let's say you have, um, you have the partitions like this, the key value pairs. So you have A1, B1, and here's a bunch of A's and B's and a bunch of A's and B's, okay? Now, when you, when you do reduce by key within each executor, right? This operation can happen because we're just, yeah, finding there's only one A and B here, two A's and two B's here and so on. So there is no data transfer at this point. 
But then when you need to, uh, you know, reduce by key across the three partitions, then there, there can be a shuffling of the data, right? To the network or whatever. So, so then maybe all the A's can go here and all the B's can go here, for example. So that's, uh, yeah. So those are the two, and there's a sort of a difference between group by key and reduce by key, because in group by key, you are somehow, you know, accumulating all of the values, right? You're sort of grouping, uh, and, and you're not like doing arithmetic or reduce operations. And in reduce by key, you know, you generally um, do this. Uh, so there are there are different there are slight differences, right? Because in the end here, you're going to get uh, an integer and a key, and an integer key in, in group by key, you actually get a vector. Basically. So then there are you have to possibly worry about like the memory footprint as, as the group you know, structure gets big, for example. Okay, so I am going to go a bit fast today so you can read more details later because uh, we have to finish this module as much as possible today. Um, and there is some kind of a homework assignment as well. So to sort of force you to know a few things. Okay, so here I've done reduce by key and, and I made this very explicit, value one, value two maps to value one plus value two. But I could have also done this incredibly simple placeholder notation. Okay. So that's, uh, so if we collect this, we will see B is five and A is six, right? So we've done baby word count, but in a fully scalable way. Okay, so so now let's look at a, a you know let's sort of do this all together, right? With just methods. So we have the words, and then now we have words dot map, get our ordered pair, um, and then we reduce by key and then collect. So that's what we were doing step by step. Okay. So. Um, Okay, there are lots of methods on RDDs. Um, you can play around. Um, so um, there's another example. You can sort by key and yeah, various things like this. So here it'll it'll be sorted by. And there is word word count pair RDD sorted by key and so on. So here's a so for, for group by key, we will use Scala's uh, uh, compact buffer uh, collect uh, data structure um, collection. And we can basically um, do it like this. So we can take the word counts pair RDD, group by key. Okay, so we can turn this into a this is how it looks, right? Uh, because it basically uses compact buffers to aggregate the, the values. Okay, so that's um, very, very minimal introduction to Spark's uh, transformations and actions and uh, some very simple uh, narrow transformations. So basically map and filter, and then some um, very primitive uh, white transformations. So reduce by key and group by key, okay? So now one thing you have to understand about Spark uh, compared to a single machine program is uh, what happens to various variables in your driver program, right? W where is it available? What's exactly the scope of the variable and, and, and so on? It's, it's a bit different from, um, from a single machine setting, right? So this is from the Spark programming guide. Um, so the idea is that, uh, so suppose, um, yeah, so the example is to consider naive RDD element sum uh, here. And the question is, it can behave differently depending on whether uh, the execution is happening within the same JVM. So remember the executor is run in a JVM. Uh, or is it going to be uh, different, right? So concretely, um, 
this is the example. So you have a var called counter initialized at zero, and then you create uh, an RDD by parallelizing some data. And then the question is, if you, if you do some sort of a for each for the RDD and say increment the counter, right? Something very standard you would do in a single machine language, Python or Scala even, um, then you know, print the value. This is going to give us a very different uh, answer because the counter is not going to be in scope here. Right, so this is uh, this whole idea of shipping um, closures, right? Um, so the scope and life cycle of variables and methods when executing code across a cl cluster. So the, the point is RDD operations that modify variables outside their scope can, can actually, um, yeah, can, can be a very uh, common source of bugs basically. So let's look here. I have this example. So array is one, two, three, four, five. Counter is zero. And then I'm creating this RDD. So we parallelize data. So now uh, when I do this, what's going to happen is, is this counter, right, is not getting incremented like you would pretend, right? I mean, like we'd expect because it's really not available inside the scope of the RDD because the RDD has these elements that are different executors. So you need to basically be aware of this. And, um, and if you want a variable to be available to all the executors, right? There are Spark provides two native variables for this. One is called a broadcast variable. and The other is called the accumulator variable. Because in MapReduce, you, 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 don't really, you don't really have a need for this, right? And if you need any specific variable that should be available at all the, all the executors, you can pass this explicitly in the map you're doing. You know, you can actually create it in the map and then it, it, it will just go through. Or you create a explicit, especially if it's a bigger object, like there's some, something much bigger you need to, uh, create it, you know, so you create it in the driver and then you can actually um, broadcast that variable to all the, all the executors. So it'll be available for them. Uh, and the broadcast variables uh, are read only, I think, yes. The accumulator variables um, can actually keep track of something that's happening with all the executors, right? So this is, um, so either you, you ship things in closure, we will see what this is, or you use broadcast variables or accumulator variables. Um, and again, all of this is because the biggest bottleneck for computational efficiency here is, is communication cost. That's why. Okay, so let's see. Um, maybe it's best to, yeah, so broadcast variables are uh, read-only, uh, accumulator variables, uh, allow us to aggregate values from workers back to the driver. Uh, so they're basically write only. Okay, so let's um, let's maybe create an accumulator variable. So accumulator variables you can see it in the in the Spark UI, which I haven't shown you yet. We'll get there. But uh, when you launch the Spark program, say in Spark Shell using Docker, then you can say localhost and go to, I think, 8080 port, and you can see the Spark UI on your local system. But uh, you can also um, use the Spark UI on Databricks. It's sort of the same thing. Okay, so let's, um, let's play here. So I'm making an accumulator variable, uh, a Spark context long accumulator. So this is a built-in variable. Um, so longs are big integers, basically. So here I can create this, and then uh, I can say sc parallelize array. So that's my RDD, and then I can say for each uh, x uh, is actually uh, getting mapped to cum dot add x. So add is a method for the long accumulator. So this way I can actually go through uh, each partition, which maybe in one or more executors and then 
I can actually use the accumulator variable to basically um, add to the same value. Okay. Um, and here I can okay, make a slightly bigger example. And so maybe. So the other way is uh, to, to have, you know, things you, you, that are available as read only on the executor. So this is the broadcast variables. And maybe let's just quickly do an example. So I can say sc.broadcast, so I can broadcast an array, for example. I can, and then the way I can get the value is by asking broadcast bar dot value. Uh, and then I can also access, you know, it's an array, so I can access elements of the array like this. So if I do an RDD by parallelizing one to 10, uh, so that's my one to 10, I can map. Um, mod three, so one to zero, one to zero, and so on. Um, and let's see. So now I can, for example, add to the broadcast variables value. Let's see, one, two, three. I'm just sort of making some, some, some it's a simple example, right? So that uh, for each element of the RDD, I'm able to map zero, one to the element of the broadcast variable, okay? So this thing is kind of simple, but it's super general. So if you have two tables, later on we will see, one table is really huge. So that's like split up between all the executors. So a bunch of rows, right? And then there's another table that's a bit smaller, which can easily fit in each of the executors memory, let's say. Then you would actually broadcast the smaller table everywhere and say, and then when you do a join, you know, then you would basically do a join on the, from, from the big, big table into the small, because all values of the small table are available at every executor. You would simply march through the rows of the big table in each executor in parallel, and then simply look up a corresponding row for a given join column, right? Have people done SQL? And am I just, okay, that's fine. So you, you will learn a little bit of SQL later on. But yeah, basically the idea of joining tables, right? There are two, two tables and they have a common column that can be compared can be compared by. And when you're joining, you're simply finding, you know, using this common column value, you're simply aggregating all the row elements in the first table and the second table. Okay. Usually say, this is person number and income, whatever, and this is person number and like whatever, uh, grades or something, then you can sort of, um, at degrees or whatever, then you can join, right? So yeah, the point is when you join two tables, one of them is small enough to be broadcasted, then broadcast variables are what Spark does in, in, in the background for you. Okay. You can unpersist the broadcasted variable uh, in the memory, because otherwise it's just standing there being used. In the, so you can just unpersist it like this. And here's a more interesting example of a broadcast variable. So let's say we have a lot of states. So this is just a map, like the acronym for New York to this full name of the state, California, Florida, and countries, which is another map. USA to United States and IN to India. And then broadcast states, Spark, Spark context broadcast states. So I'm going to broadcast these states as my broadcast variable. And uh, this is the broadcast of the countries, right? Broadcasting all the countries. So now, once that's done, I can assume that all the executors will have a read only version of these two, these two maps. That's it. And then here is the data, and I have sequence um, of a first name, last name, country, state, a bunch of people. So this is like my basic table, right? It's a sequence of tuples, so you can think of them as rows. And then I'm going to create an RDD, which sim simply takes uh, my data and, and turns that into a um, 
into an RDD basically using Parallelize. So then these things could potentially be billions of rows, but it's a small cluster. But yeah, the idea is that this will be now in different executors split up, and then those broadcast variable states and countries are available for them. So we could do stuff like this. So my RDD2 is equal to this RDD of the sequence of first name, last name, country, state, and I'm mapping. So I map F. Uh, so what am I doing here? So you see this curly brace, this is one whole block, okay? So whatever an element F in my RDD, I'm converting it into various things. So first inside I have ball country is the third element of the tuple, right? So this is an F, so one, two, three, third element of the tuple, remember there's underscore notation. Uh, so that'll be the country, right? And then state will be the fourth element, full country and full state is where I'm going to use my broadcast countries that I put in um, throughout. Uh, I find its value and then I use the get country. So this will basically give me, um, yeah, give me the, the, yeah, I'm using the map idea, right? So this country is, is whatever, USA, for example, and then this is a map. So get key dot get will give me the, the full name of the country. Yeah. So, so F1, F2, full country, full state, and should be this. Okay, so I can print this. Okay, so of course you can broadcast more fancy things and uh, the most fancy broadcasts I've done, maybe we will do this is when you have like, you know, let's say the trajectory of taxis over Beijing for two months or something, one month, there was a data from Microsoft Research floating around from several years ago. So they had the taxi trajectories in Beijing for a month. It's a huge chunk of data. And then the problem there is uh, the trajectories are noisy. So you, it's a GPS, right? And the problem is it won't be exactly on the road. So there is a little process called map matching. So you basically snap the trajectory to the nearest road segment. So there you have to insane just open street map and kind of keep it into some crazy Java data structure. And then there is this map matching algorithm, which is a single machine algorithm that needs some data uh, structure. So then you build this data structure and broadcast it and it's available for the map matching process to do its job, right? So that's maybe one of the most complicated things I've done before, but it's the same idea. And a lot of pain <laughs> because it's coding, unfortunately. Um, so when I say homework, I mean it, like you should sort of go through this on your own because we won't have time to march through everything. But Quickly, you know, you can import libraries like Scala math um, dot underscore. So you can say import minimum, maximum, or all sorts of other uh, operations, whatever library you want. Java libraries can also be brought in, say, say hash map. So you can, um, yeah, you can import Java and work directly here. Okay, so this one, I think, I am going to let you do this on your own. I think one of the homework problems is about take ordered, but it should not be too hard to like make sense of this stuff now. Okay, so um, there's some, some things on ordering, uh, reversing the order, some more examples on maps, some more on filter, reduce, so this is mainly to get you used to different kinds of scalar notation for this function and so on. There's also some other uh, caveats on knowing the sort of limits of your numeric types, right? Because int and long have min and max values like this. So, you know, it's not like infinite precision or multiple precision, staggered precision. So, yeah, so things are okay, but you know, you can, keep multiplying and quickly get out of range, right? So here, multiply one through 21, you're gonna go negative. <laughs> so yeah, yeah. And, and you know, this, this also has limits at some point, right? So if you go 
multiply one long by two long by three long up to 61 long zero outside. So anyway, you, you won't do stuff like this. Um, okay, so this is a bit more transformations and actions. Distinct is a really nice uh, uh, transformation. So if you have a whole bunch of elements, often you wanna know what the distinct ones are in this collection and um, distinct does this. Um, so will distinct be a narrow or a wide transformation? You think it'll be narrow? Why? I mean, it's a, imagine like it's just integers, right? And there are repeats of them everywhere, right? So it's got repeating integers. So you have to find all the distinct ones. Then what will you do? I mean, somehow you, you have to, so everywhere you are, I mean, I don't know, we can look at the code exactly how this thing works, but my, my, I mean, I would do, for example, a sort, and you could even do the sorts internally first, right? So you sort, and then you would go, once it's sorted, then you would basically go through, you know, the distinct ones, right? You can just keep reading it, and, and if it's the same as above, you skip, and then the next one. So then you can basically, yeah, if you do sorts inside each partition, then you can reduce it like this. I don't know if Spark is doing this, but we could do this, right? And then each partition you can again sort and, and make it distinct like this. How else can you do the distinct without sorting? I don't know, anyway. So then uh, you're gonna, but then at some point what's gonna happen is you're going to have to, Take the take the elements here, distinct elements here, and distinct elements here, and then eventually, you know, you have to somehow sort them as well, right? To figure out what is distinct among those, right? So I don't know. You can you can prove me wrong, which would be great. Um, I think distinct is is a, is a wide transformation. If if I if you use my yeah. So the result you got is four, two, one, three. Yeah. But uh, why would that happen? I mean, uh, if you take a look at the uh, array, it should normally speaking, it should be like four, one, three, two. Three, 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 three. Yeah. So distinct is not the same as uh, what is it called? So you can do distinct and then you can do order by. So yeah, think distinct. I mean, uh, so if it, if it, like inside the start, we keep the order, then why is this? Like no, no, I'm, I must really, uh, so I just like cooked up an algorithm on the fly right now. So oh, okay. I'm not saying this is, we can find out what Spark is doing. Maybe that's a, that's a good exercise to dive into something. I was just cooking up a, an algorithm of like, okay, how do I, how do I do this thing? To, um, yeah, so I think, I think Spark might do it. Uh, yeah, I don't know I mean, exactly. No, no, you cannot understand it like this. So sorry, <laughs> maybe this is a bad example. So uh, let let me look at what distinct, how Spark does distinct at the break, or we can all look at it. But uh, but yeah, distinct. The output of distinct is only guaranteed to produce, you know, distinct elements in the output RDD. It is no sorting on top of it. Um, so let's not. Uh, but I intuitively I would be very surprised if if distinct is is narrow. Okay. All right. I mean, yeah, I'm talking like just like purely. Yeah. Okay. Good. So I mean, yeah. Let's look at it later. Um, so anyway, I don't want to go through this. I, I, I really, really, and, and as your PhD students, I mean, I'm assuming you're going to go through this yourself. No, <laughs> that's good. I mean, yeah, we, we don't have time to, you know, um, yeah. So most of the stuff that I wanted to, it's there and it's only to give you some exercises, okay? Uh, let's do word count. So this is what I wanted to do. Uh, 
maybe I'll say a few things about this example. And I would like you to start the ingestion before the break, because it's going to take a little bit of time. Because we're doing ingestion in this very naive way, kind of on purpose. So it's this data set from the State of the Union addresses by US presidents. So what we first should do is to uh, load the data uh, from this notebook. So if you go to, right, so you probably don't have this loaded yet. Um, so what you should do is um, download this. Uh, so I think if you just right click and open a new tab, this link extra resources. So then yeah, just download that. And um, then you can actually uh, go to this directory. So I believe you can go to scalable data sciences and then import that BBC file you just uh, downloaded, right? So so then you should get a folder like this, right? So this extra resources.dvc. And inside that folder, you should see this notebook. Have you done this before? Okay, good. Yeah, no, I hope it works. Okay, so what would be nice to do uh, while well, we're taking a break is to have you loaded this? Okay. Uh, yeah, so basically follow these instructions. Um, you can sort of yeah, w get this tgz file. Uh, so it just comes from and then you will see this, it's sou.tgz. Yeah, here are all the environment variables. Um, so then if you do tar zxvf sou.tgz, you will see after it's untar. Um, and if you see, this is basically all the files in it. Uh, so all we want to do is, okay, the, you just head it, you will see some, it's just the state of the union. Um, yeah, so you can, okay, they're all there. So now what I want to do is basically, uh, person FS is the file system for database. So you can sort of list all the stuff. And we put all the data sets we got, grab into this folder called data sets. So you can sort of see this. Uh, it may not be there if it's not there. Don't worry, we're going to make this now. So if you do dbutils fs make this sou, it will create this, this folder. And then if you do this, it should be there. Okay. Uh, yeah. And yeah, so then you can simply copy this. So copy dash R recursively. So this file colon means the file in the driver, right? That's where we doubly got and put it in the, in the driver machine. Uh, from there, you're copying it to this place. Basically, this is in the distributed file system. In okay, case so after you've done that, you should see this. So this is what will take Maybe it doesn't take much time. Anyway, so we should be in this step. So we will meet uh, in 15 minutes, 16, 18. Okay, so this is an example from a PNAS paper in 2015. They were sort of looking at uh, some lexical shifts uh, in sort of 
the State of the Union addresses of US presidents from the first one to one of the recent ones. I think Trump's first speech is here, or maybe Trump's first and second speeches are here. So yeah, it's some sort of uh, digital humanities, natural language processing work, okay? Uh, we don't have to worry too much about this. Uh, we're mainly just learning the basics of processing some simple data. Okay, so in terms of like high level, uh, this data we're using is called unstructured data. This is just text. Uh, so if you just have like a whole bunch of video and sound and stuff like this, they're generally considered unstructured data. Um, structured data are basically tables, like where you have already taken the data and have columns, known column names and data types and so on. Those are structured. And then there's something in the middle called uh, semi-structured data, uh, which could be like JSON files, like JavaScript object notation for you know, describing what the data is. So that's sort of semi-structured. Um, yeah, if you go to some job and they may ask like questions like what is structured data then should read blogs like this. But yeah, basically, um, yeah, what I said is the is the main, main, main difference. The point with structured data is that uh, you already know uh, Typically, you'll know the full schema for the table. So you'll know the number of columns, the type of columns, and so on. So if you know the data types, you can do a lot of optimization. Okay. And Spark does a lot of this as well. But uh, let's, uh, let's process this uh, unstructured text file. So we, we can do, we can list everything in DBFS and specifically the stuff that we loaded. So we should have these files here. And one of the nice commands is uh, uh, head. So you can always look at the head of a file and specify some maximum bytes you want to see. Okay. So this is uh, again, specific for Databricks uh, file system. Uh, you can do something similar in HDFS also. Okay, so that gives you we can play around, change the number of bytes and so on. So the next main thing we're going to do is to say, read the first one, say George Washington's speech. Um, um, so this simply is the path to the file system. So we just uploaded it. Uh, and then we use sc.txt file method. So this will simply read the text file as an RDDF string. So each string in the RDD, right? Each element comes from the file where the default delimiter is the end of line character. So it'll read line at a one line at a time. Right? Um, so if you have other delimiters, there are you have to write, you know, you have to modify the the readers. But basically, end of line is your standard delimiter. So then we can count. We can simply count the number of lines in this file. There's only 23. We can take the first five, it'll come as an array. So this is the first line, the second line is an empty, third line and so on. Okay, we can also do for each println to see how it looks. Uh, collect. We can kind of boldly collect here because we, we know there's only 23 lines and um, yeah, so that's all of the data in the first address. Um, so what you can do is if, uh, because if you're going to reuse an RDD many, many times, you can use this dot cache method, okay? So this cache method uh, has a lot of arguments you can send to it, but the Default one is that it will cache it in memory, right? So I can say this is all lazily done, right? I see text file, and then the cache is also lazy. The first time you do an action after caching, 
it will actually uh, cache this RDD in memory. It's a memory or it is built to disk. So this is supposed to be a little bit faster, although this is such a small data set, you don't really see much difference, but later on we will see caching helps a lot. Um, okay, so this is generally what we do, right? So we have grid data, data either comes in from some distributed source, uh, some external source, and it can be something that's coming in in a queue um, and gets processed, but typically it'll, it'll be written to a distributed file system and then you would read from the distributed file system and, and, and build a model or explore it or whatever, right? Um, so then we will generally transform these RDDs uh, into new RDDs, cache them and perform some actions on them. That's generally what we do. Uh, transforming lines to words. So we can do flat map, take every line and split it by white space and then say, take the first hundred. So now we're gonna get words <coughs> from it, right? So flat mapped all the lines into words. So now we have RDD of strings, which are just words. And then we collect it, it's an array of RDDs. So then we can do a very naive word count which basically flat maps the lines into words and then adds the integer one and then reduce by key. Now we use this placeholder notation and collect. So this is just a sort of a naive word count. Okay. So for example, it's counting this empty line. There's one empty line. Okay, so we can do some regular, regular expression matching, regexing. So this, all the languages have regex uh, and Python, and of course, and Scala also has regex. So let's say we want to replace multiple white space characters with one white space character, then um, uh, that would be nice to do. And then maybe we want to remove various punctuations and so on. Uh, how do we do the regex for it? Here's a simple example. Uh, this is Schmeagel and Golem talking to each other. Um, so then I can say, take this example, replace all uh, uh, white space characters uh, by one white space character. Um, yeah, and yeah, this is a Databricks thing. You, you sometimes have to escape the backslash character with the additional backslash character. It's kind of a Databricks thing. So um, most of the other stuff, it, yeah, the other stuff will work. Um, so replace the following punctuations with an empty string and let's, and then convert everything to lowercase. So that's some cleaning, right? Uh, oh, maybe I didn't evaluate this. Okay. Okay. So here is a more sophisticated word count. So again, place multiple white space characters, one white space, place the following uh, with, uh, with the empty, empty string. And then, then I split on the on the white space. Then I map uh, and reduce. So later on, you will see when we get into a machine learning library, and we will use various uh, uh, various built-in methods to remove certain kinds of words and do other sort of cleaning and natural language processing pipelines. But it's good to do these things from scratch. Uh, so now I'm going to take the word count, sort by the second uh, element, right? So this underscore dot underscore two basically says sort by uh, the second element, which is basically the numbers, the counts. And um, yeah, so I can collect and simply 
see that the appeared 97 times off, 68 times, and so on. So this is doing it all together for George Washington and Barack Obama. Uh, so I mean, I you can just comment. I'm just commenting and I'm commenting here, right? So the idea is that you could turn this into a function that takes this text file as a string and, and, and does these counts for you automatically. Okay. Uh, what about all the text files? So there is this nice method called whole text files. It's a built-in method. If you do se dot whole text files, and then use this sort of star dot text in this pattern matching, it will read all the text files in that directory, and then return to you like an RDD of a pair of strings. The first string is the name of the file. The second string is the content of the file. So this is super convenient. Um, and there are 231 files. Okay. So this time I, I cached. So first time nine, nine seconds. If I do the count again, because it's cached, it's only 0.48 seconds. So here you can see the effective caching in memory. Uh, I can take two and then start seeing, okay, here's the name of the file. And then the second element is the content of the file, right? And the same below. It should be here. Second element, name of the file, and then the content. Okay, so what can we do with this? Um, we can just, uh, you know, just look at the file names by simply mapping the pair to just the first element in the tuple. Okay, that's uh, something. Um, you can also, for each file contents pair, you can you can um, create a WC by taking the second element and then doing all the usual cleaning we did. Okay, and then returning the the word count. And what will that do? That'll take this WCS. Um, so the WCS will basically give you a whole bunch of, of counts. Ah, let me run this. Okay. So that just tells us what? I mean, that's the total number of clean words that we can process per file, right? And you can do other things. You can play with sort by. Um, and, and here, I think we are simply, uh, yeah, this is the same thing. Mm. So this one uh, you know, allows you to get the top 10 uh, words by simply using sort by and then um, taking the 10. Okay. So here's a, another little homework for you to try. So if you do dbutilsfs.help, Um, you can see that there are several functions. So file system utilities, copy, head, ls, make, dir. So we've used a few of these already. RM and so on. Um, so exercise two is count the number of each word across all the files and output the result as an array of word comma count. Right. And then you want this to be from the most frequent to the least frequent. Can you do this? You should be able to do this. Yeah, it's uh, exactly. Yeah, it's a combination of this and, and doing uh, the uh, something with the whole text files. 
Okay, so this is uh, word counts. Um, now you're supposed to be like, hey, I've done my hello world of big data. <laughs> Sorry, it's not so exciting, but uh, things will get more interesting, I, I promise. So I, I'm i gonna say that this is an advanced topic. I, I won't get into it, but I will, it's there. Uh, the main idea is that you should know what these are and um, depending on, you know, on, on, on um, what you want to scale, what do you want to distribute, uh, it, it, this may be the easiest way for you to achieve um, um, this distribution. So the idea is called the piped RDD. So these are like pipes, like bash pipes, you know, so you, some programs output goes through the pipe into another program. Same. Okay, that's the same pipe. So in pipe RDDs, what we are basically saying is, uh, let's sort of maybe use a couple examples. So, right, so this is, uh, yeah. Um, we'll, you can do the, yeah, this is how you can play with Python on the side if you want, yeah? So you can also do person Python, no person Py and, and have the Python syntax. So we can do words.glom and collect, um, same in Python. Um, and um, it's um, for several programs, you may want to have a checkpoint directory. Uh, it allows you to checkpoint, uh, you know, which is basically write intermediate computations in an art of, of say the lineage of some RDD transformations into, into a file so that you can, if, if things break, you can start from the checkpointed uh, files basically. So, so here is a, the, the tiny example. So I have ha ha words, I see parallelize. So this backslash n is a end of line character, right? So so it's um, so if I do haha -ha words go on collect, this is how it looks. So I have an array of ha ha, he he he, and so on. Um, so in this example, I just wanted to show you this command wc l. It's a bash command that's available in all the executors, all the the system level. So it simply counts the number of lines of any, um, yeah, of anything, right? And this is why I put this end of line characters in these examples. So this one has two lines, this one has three lines, and this has four lines, right? Because there are that many end of lines char characters. So if I if I want to say uh, do it like this, words dot pipe. So I use this. So I take any RDD and then I call the method pipe on it. And then whatever program is passed as argument will actually be, uh, uh, so every element in the RDD will be piped through this. So that's the idea. So then I can do uh, wc l pipe RDD dot collect. Then I'm gonna get uh, five and five because that's the number of lines in, uh, in, in each of them. So the main idea here is that uh, this sort of builds and gets into map partitions and so on. But what I wanted to point out is that, suppose you, you're writing some code in like in another language, say, say C or something, and you build an executable, and this is very carefully thought out. So if it takes certain inputs, it will do some operations and then provide some text output. Then if you want to parallelize this, then pipe.eds are your go-to place, okay? Because then you can do lots of processing of some data and then turn them into RDDs and then these RDDs have strings and then these strings can be passed as input to this executable that you can create uh, and, and load it into, into the, into, into the in, Executors. So that's what this example goes through. So I, I don't want to go to it. Maybe later on, if there's a project, we can come to it. But because uh, it, it involves quite a lot of other stuff. Okay. 
So pipe RDDs are super useful. Now let's get into SQL because I really wanted to spend time on this. Uh, so we are leaving the, the basic land of Spark Core, okay, with RDDs, transformations, and actions. Uh, and we're going to move to this next library layer, which is Spark SQL. So uh, it builds on top of Spark Core, but it has quite a lot of uh, built-in uh, magic for us, basically. Okay. So, and it borrows heavily from Pandas data frame or R data frame, originally R data frame. So it gives you this kind of abstraction and it's for structured data. So, so SQL is structured query language. Um, so you will learn this in a basic database course. And the HypeQL is, uh, is another um, flavor, but uh, let's not get too, yeah, so this is the main thing. So RDDs uh, are this low level, um, API, and the, there are two other higher level APIs that are called data sets and data frames. And um, this is basically what we will be doing at Spark SQL. Yeah? There is this. Oh, yes, yeah, sorry, you have to have good point. You have to upload it. So I just pushed it. It's in, uh, sorry, it's in our usual place. So, um, yeah. Uh, yeah, so go here and then uh, so Lamastex scalable data science, github.com and uh, DBC archives and latest and uh, SQL. So you wanna kind of download this and upload this to database. Yeah. So, Yeah, there is a notebook that um, I couldn't fix it before the class started. So we'll, we'll see if we get there. Um, so Johannes is this uh, master student of mine. He's much better coding than me. He found a way to fix it around. So we'll code it. That is um, 007C. Um, okay, so. I'm, I'm basically marching through the programming guide, right? So this is a lot faster than you doing it, but the idea is that after you go through this, you should dive deeper on your own time. Okay, so uh, let's, let's um, recall that we basically, this is our entry point into uh, the Spark session. So now uh, we're first gonna look at creating um, data frames. Okay, so how to create a data frame uh, with a Spark session or a SQL context uh, from an existing RDD or from a table or other data sources. So, um, and, you know, a data frame basically is a distributed collection of data organized into named columns. It is not strongly typed. There is uh, another thing called data set which is strongly typed. So there's basically data frames and data sets on top of RDDs. Um, so the way to think about it is, as it's organized into a table um, uh, RDD of case classes called rows. And, um, and the data frame 
in comparison to RDDs are backed by very, very good optimizations. So what are the optimizations? They can track uh, their own schema. Uh, they can do adaptive query execution. They can do code generation. Um, so this means like you will specify a whole bunch of things you want to do. We will see examples soon with an RDD. And then once you've created all of this, um, uh, in a data frame, it will actually take what you want to do and then figure out a logical plan. It'll optimize the logical plan and then use a cost-based physical plan, choose it, and then actually only then execute it when you call an action. So because of lazy evaluations, uh, data frames can really, uh, you know, Spark can, 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 you know, when you write code in data frames, Spark can try and use all these optimizations for you, although you don't know anything. And as opposed to this, if you do things directly in RDD, you are like, well, you have full control, so you can do anything, but often it'll be very difficult to like figure out what's the right way to do it. Should I do a filter before I do a join or, you know, these kinds of things, right? So that's what uh, essentially, um, you know, uh, when, when you do Spark SQL, a lot of this is taken care of. There is this optimization engine called Catalyst and Spark SQL. That's what actually does all this planning and so on. Okay, and um, so let's sort of get our hands dirty quickly. So here is um, to create an empty data frame, data frame from a range, data frame from RDD, data frame operations, and then running SQL queries programmatically. This, this bundle has a lot of homeworks. So some of them are more, mostly reading, some are doing by hand. So I will sort of skip through parts of this quickly. I'll let you do this. Um, and then uh, uh, I'll, I'll mainly try to show you how to work on some of these examples. And then we can do machine learning, beginning of machine learning. So this is basically an empty data frame. So you just do spark.empty data frame that will create an empty data frame for you. There are lots of methods for empty data frames, so you can sort of check it out. Um, it's just any data frame, right? So there's a lot. Um, making a data frame from a range, so you can do spark.range. So it's 2DF is the method, so you can create a data frame like this. Um, and you can do show. So it, ID is this default column name it creates if you don't specify uh, anything for the first column. So make a data frame from an RDD. So here you're parallelizing uh, a one, two, five, and then mapping each element to this pair. Now you can do RDD one dot collect. So you'll see an array of tuples, two tuples. And you can always, uh, to 2df to that, and it will create columns like this underscore one and underscore two as the column names for you, the sort of default names it does. Right? And you can do dot show and see you know, it's just two columns. Uh, you can also do 2df and then give it names like this. So this is a fast way to just name the columns once and twice. Um, so you can do all of this at once here. Okay. Now, data frame operations. Um, so these are, um, so let's look at the schema. Um, okay, so this is uh, once is an integer, twice an integer, and they are not nullable, right? So that means they have to be explicitly an integer. You can't take null values, so you can also have, uh, nullable version. So we will see how to create schemas more programmatically soon. So this is just selecting one column. So select ones, and you can also use this syntax with this dollar sign as a way to get the column name. Um, so this is now an expression. So if I do column ones plus one, so this is an SQL expression. It's gonna add one to each element of once, right? So this will be. Uh, okay. <clears throat> so here you can do this dot as method to rename 
this column as once more. So these are quick syntactic things. So you can also, so we, when you put a dollar in quotes, it's a, it's a column object. Then you can actually do expressions like this. This is greater than two. So you can filter once greater than two. So all the one to one guys, one and two guys gets dropped out. So that's uh, filtering on a data frame. You can also do group by. So, um, so remember the group by key and reduce by key in RDDs. All of these are done for you uh, under the hood when you do um, when you do stuff like this. So we can group by ones and count. So then you can see there's only one occurrence of each of these things. Okay. So here, let's do a slightly more interesting group by. So we can do uh, SC parallelized three to five, map I A times two to DF once and twice, and DF one one dot show. So that's just three, six, four, eight, five, ten. And then now I can use this union of DF one and DF one one and get this data frame. It's really literally stacks the other two data frames together, right? Um, so now I can do DF111 group by ones count, just to show you a slightly more interesting count. Okay, so now there's three, sorry, two threes and fives and fours. Okay, so this is where you would go for, uh, for documentation. Those are using some nice IDE. Oh, what's good on? Uh, um, yeah, I guess you sorry you have to search. Okay. Um uh, yeah, so I think those things just go to the search and then you can search here. So this is uh how you can dive deeper. Okay, data frame function reference. I hope this. Yeah, so we have to for you have you have to type here. Um, uh, partitioned state. Yeah, I think, uh, I'm sorry. So this, this thing has changed. Um, so anyway, we should be able to, so yeah, this is secure search. I guess, yeah, I guess everything is done by searching now. Okay. Uh, it used to bring all these sub, sub pages like last few months ago. Okay, so, um, now running SQL queries programmatically. So let's say we have this DF1 and um, what I want to do is to register, register the data frame as a SQL temporary view. So this is uh, using this method create or replace temp view. And I'm gonna call this table SD table, right? So once I do this, once I convert a data frame to a, a registered uh, table, uh, then I can do stuff like this. I can actually um, do pure SQL commands. So those of you who know SQL should realize that this is a SQL command, select star, star means every column from the table. And that's what this is. And so you can do, so once you've registered it, you can basically do spark.sql or you can just directly do should be able to do this percent SQL and this should work. I think. Okay. Um, 
so yeah, SQL for interactive querying is uh, is very powerful, and a lot of analysts, you know, in, in industry, yeah, they definitely are very comfortable with SQL. So we will drop back between Scala, functional programming way of doing SQL, and SQL. Uh, so there is one of the notebooks in pure SQL later on. So should play around with this so you can. So the next main idea is global temporary view uh, versus temporary view. So this is if you want uh, you know, uh, the table that you're creating to actually um, be available across different Spark sessions. So uh, then, then you have to do something slightly different uh, using this global temp variable. So there are examples later on that show you how to do this. So that, uh, you know, on the, on the same cluster from different Spark sessions, you can access the same table. Otherwise, the table will only be available to the Spark session that created. Okay. So this can be useful when multiple analysts are like trying to access the same standardized table different Spark sessions. So data sets I told you are, are different. They are they're also similar to RDDs. Uh, however, they use uh, you know, specialized encoders and they keep track of, uh, of all of the, the, the detailed information of the types at each column. So, so here is a, a Spark data set. So um, yeah, so here, this is a data set of long and you can show, so it's very similar to a data frame. Um, so here we have a slightly more complicated object, uh, person, this name, string, age is a long. This is, we're using Scala case class here. Okay. And then, uh, so this is a case class data set, which is sequence of various persons, right? So this is person 90, 32, 844, and so on. And then this 2DS is what converts to a data set. Okay. So this is all just sort of syntax. Uh, primitive data set, so you can just take a seek and then two data set and, and then map this and collect it. Um, see what this looks like. So we have once and twice, and this is a data frame or data set, so you can show. And here we have a case class called single and double integers once and twice, so we're going to convert so now we can take this data frame, df1, and use this as method on this case class specifically defined for it and convert it to a data set, okay? So, so yeah, generally a lot of machine learning uh, library is, is written in RDD level. There's one library, later on we'll see it's written with pure RDDs. Then there's another one that's written purely with data frames, okay? But there are, there are other things that are written with data sets. And uh, so there are kind of these three things. Most of the time you will be using data frames or data sets in Spark. And the way to interoperate between them is, is, is just like this. So you need, to, you need to know exactly the details of every, every column. And then you can create case classes and go from data frame to a data set. Okay, so I am going to give you some homework. <laughs> because you know I, people are falling asleep so this is all syntactic so you need to kind of go through this yourself because that's not so these these notebooks uh, are kind of homework notebooks so there's no exercises yet but there is a separate exercise in studium i will release but by going through these notebooks carefully you should be able to do the exercises in the assignment okay um yes so 007C had a, a slight issue. So let's see if, so Johannes was fixing it. Things break all the time after a few months. I go to the same code and it's, it's so annoying. It's not like mathematics, right? So theorems don't change every few months. <laughs> so anyway, what we're trying to do here is to, uh, yeah, this is a homework. I want you to go through this carefully. It's a little bit involved. So uh, there is this data set that comes from this John Snow Labs that I've cleaned and put it here, right? So you can kind of download it. And I just wanted to load it for you, right? So there's a couple of ways to do this. So I can just uh, download this, put it on my machine, 
okay, any CSV file. And then you can go here. You should try this. Um, and then you can just say create table. And then you can, you know, uh, drop a file, some CSV file you downloaded, right? So I think, I don't know where I put my stuff, maybe in temporary. Yeah, so this is one way to do it, right? So I, I, I just downloaded the file. Now it goes up. So here there are a couple options. So file uploaded to file store table social media usage.csv. And then uh, you can do create table with user interface or create table in notebook. We can do this. Okay. Create table with UI. So then it says select a cluster. Uh, preview table, maybe. Okay, so it, it takes everything as string, right? And first row is header, okay? So all of this we can do programmatically later. So, but, okay, so agency, platform, URL, date, visits. And then this you want to be string. Let's try infra schema. So automatic infra, infra schema is, yeah, Spark basically guesses what it is by looking at the first few things and then keeps iterating and if it changes, yeah, it does, basically it does double read. Uh, usually it's quite good. Okay, so these are strings. Yeah, date is a string here and this is integer. So if I don't force it to do anything else, this is, this is fine, okay? Uh, and then you can say create table or create table in notebook. Okay, so you, you can yeah go either way, but I'll say create table. Uh, CSV. I'm gonna rename this as table. Okay. Uh, GUI. Oh, maybe that's too big. So I'll just do GUI. Oh right, table names can only contain lowercase. So okay, so then I can create this table. So you can always do this, right? And then your table will be available as, a, you know, as, as, a, as a managed table. So you will see it here. The other way I was trying to do was to download directly from the URL using like Scala IO uh, methods. Okay, it seems, it seems all right. Okay, so that's your table. So if you go to data now, you see it's here, social media, GUI. I've been trying to make one more programmatically and I'm not sure if it's working that. So let's see. So let me go here. So please go through these slowly. Uh, and the only problematic one is this one. Now you know how to create a table in the GUI by just downloading this file. Uh, oh no, so go to the wrong one. Just one sec. Um, and then what I would like to do next time is to sort of start from the last three notebooks here on uh, extract, transform, and load operations for this diamond data set and this power plant examples. So we are ready to go into machine learning. Okay. So I think this is the... Yeah, so you see what I'm doing here. So I have, I'm using Scala IO source from URL and grabbing it from URL, getting lines and then splitting. Oh yeah, we better get out of here. So yeah, um, it's, uh, yeah. So the programmatic way of doing it, you will have to struggle a little bit, but you can do the GUI way. Okay, so see you on Thursday.